Um, you can find out anything else you might like to know about him on Wikipedia or in your program. So I'll just hand it over. Thanks. Please. Thank you. So. Uh, I've always been interested in public policy questions. In recent years, my interest has shifted more and more towards the societal and even legal aspects of uh, what we're doing. So this paper, the co-authors, Renee Hutchins is a law professor. Tony Jabbar is a machine learning professor. Sebastian Zimmick is a PhD student who happen, of mine who happens to be an attorney. Uh, and machine learning, I don't think I have to tell anybody here this, it finds all sorts of patterns. Some of the things you do with machine learning are pretty obvious, and some are not. In particular, I claim that it can be used to help shape legal doctrine. And the particular question we looked at is, should the police be required to get a search warrant before tracking somebody's location, in particular over a long period? And the classical legal answer to this is no. If you're moving around in public, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. I put it in quotes because that's a legal standard that's been in place since 1967. Uh, if you're doing something, uh, is it reasonable subjectively and objectively for you to expect it to be private? If you move around in public, maybe you don't. And the fact that technology is used to assist in following may not be an obstacle either. There was a 1982 Supreme Court case known in the law biz as Knotts, Knotts of the United States, where they attached a, police attached a beeper to a drum of chemicals to be used in making uh, methamphetamine. The Supreme Court said, no, you're driving around on public roads. You have no expectation of privacy. But legal academy has been looking at this again. You know, law professors write just as many papers as CS professors do, only they're a lot longer, like 50, <laughs> 50 to 70 pages, one-third footnotes by volume. A lot of other very strange differences, like you're supposed to submit simultaneously to multiple places, but that's a separate talk. Uh, and one check on police power is economic. They can't afford to follow somebody 24-7 for an extended period of time unless it's a really, really important case. And this is a practical check on police power, this economic aspect of it. GPS tracking of somebody is much, much cheaper. That's removing this check on police power. There's an even newer theory, though, called the mosaic theory. And it basically boils down patterns of movement are much more revealing than just a few days' worth. And before I can go any further, I have to go back to the legal standard we're dealing with, the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which governs search and seizure. Won't bother reading it to you all. Popular theory is that the police need a warrant to, search, to, uh, to conduct a search. That's not, in fact, what the Fourth Amendment says. It says that it bars searches that are unreasonable. If you have a warrant, proper warrant, it's reasonable. If you don't have a warrant, it's unreasonable. It, it might be unreasonable. So the question that we have to consider is, is extended period of location tracking reasonable or unreasonable? And that is the standard. So mosaic theory holds that a large enough, long enough period of location tracking is very, very revealing. You learn more from an extended period of tracking than just the directly observed points. Never mind even the economic aspects of it, but this amount that you learn that is not directly observed is the total pattern of movements that's so revealing. On the other hand, the classical legal scholars and the practitioners, that's to say district attorneys and police departments, raised a very, very valid objection how do you draw the line? When do, is enough enough? Where, how much tracking do you reach the mosaic theory? Where does it, when, when you can start learning too much? Well, the only case about location tracking in a modern sense that's ever reached the Supreme Court was three years ago, a case known as uh, United States versus Jones. They attached a GPS tracker to his car for four weeks and followed his movements that way. And it's not even that they didn't think to get a warrant, the warrant had expired. 
You can call it a technicality, but Fourth Amendment doctrine is full of technicalities. And believe me, I've been studying a lot about Fourth Amendment law in recent years. A lot of my legal uh, policy work has been on technology meets the Fourth Amendment. I'm working on a new paper right now. The Supreme Court unanimously overturned the conviction, but they didn't look at the mosaic theory. They said it was a unanimous vote, classical Fourth Amendment doctrine, physical intrusion on his car to attach the tracker. Well, that's not going to last very much longer because most of us are carrying tracking devices with us. We call them phones. Law enforcement can call them trackers. We've bugged ourselves. The interesting thing about the Jones case was not so much the 9 nothing ruling on classical grounds, but what some of the justices said in their concurrences. So Justice Sotomayor in a concurrence held that the Fourth Amendment is really protecting the information rather than just physical objects. It's just papers. It's not the physical piece of paper that the Fourth Amendment is protecting. It's protecting the information that's on that paper. And she pointed out at some length just how revelatory certain locations, pieces of location, could be. The kinds of things that you might actually learn about somebody just from where they go. And she, this was the sole one, but her, she, she wrote this concurrence by herself, uh, but she actually came very close to using the words mosaic theory in the concurrence. Equally important, though, was Justice Alito's concurrence, and he was joined by three other justices. He said that maybe three days is okay, as in the Knotts case, but 28 days is surely too much. He didn't want to draw the line, but it just said 28 days is surely too much. And he was joined by three other justices. So those four plus Sotomayor says maybe five justices would back the mosaic theory or something like it. But Justice Scalia wrote the opinion of the court in the Jones case, and he actually responded to uh, Justice Alito's concurrence and said, it remains unexplained why a four-week investigation is surely too long. Why? Why is four weeks too long when three days is okay? What is the rationale for doing it? And this is where I came in. Now, I was the least qualified person to work on the paper. I'm not a law professor. I don't I know very little about machine learning. The fourth author was a, as a PhD student. I had one advantage. One is that I was the only one on the group who could actually talk to the other three because the machine learning guy knows nothing of American legal theory and the law professor knows nothing of uh, technology. And the graduate student, though an attorney, is an intellectual property attorney and from Germany, though also a member of the California bar. But I could talk to everybody. Also, it was my idea. <laughs> and. You know, machine learning can be used to make predictions about things based on location. Tony Jabara actually has done startups making predictions based on location data, which is why I asked him to join on this paper. And so my claim is when predictions get accurate enough, you have reached the mosaic point. So I say we can use computer science to answer <coughs> Justice Scalia's objection to the mosaic theory. When our algorithms can make, start making good enough predictions, we have reached the mosaic point. And so we reviewed the technical literature on predictions from location data. Don't look at the curve. This is, not a this is not a paper of hours. Don't look at the curve, but look at these data points. This is trying to predict somebody's ethnicity based on location data, not even GPS location data, which is very accurate, but cell phone grade, which is about a mile radius. So after for the first five weeks, you get no place trying to predict their ethnicity. Suddenly after five weeks, we get a significant improvement in accuracy, and about uh, 28 weeks, it suddenly jumps up quite sharply. I would assert that for, if you're trying to predict somebody's ethnicity, at about this point, you have reached the mosaic. You've suddenly been able to predict something that you, perhaps you were not able to observe directly based solely on this algorithm. Now, why does this work? Well, this is machine learning. We don't know why it works. <laughs> it's correlation, not causality. Yeah, you have a question? Uh, I see the uh, horizontal axis is labeled in the least. What is the vertical axis? Uh, accuracy of the prediction. 
So at, 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 at 28 weeks to 30 weeks, it gets to about 60% accurate. Good question. In fact, we can do better than that. It turns out from the literature that your week-to-week -week movements are very predictable. Yes, even on weekends. Your weekend movements are very different than your weekday movements, but they're still predictable. It might be going to church, it might be going to synagogue, it might be taking the kids to soccer practice, it might be going out downtown to your favorite restaurant. The experimental evidence shows, if I recall the number, is about 93% predictable week-to-week -week movements. So in one week of movement, seven consecutive days, you've got a very full picture of somebody's life. And so we assert that this operationally is where the mosaic point is. In one week, you've got a very good picture of an average person's life. So does mosaic theory make location tracking unreasonable in the words of the Fourth Amendment? Do people have a reasonable expectation of privacy in their location, not just in their location, but in the inferences that can be drawn from it? This is a legal question. This is not a technical question. You know, current law says that once information is lawfully obtained, police can do any sort of analysis on it that they want. But here we're saying this location tracking inherently is going to lead to this kind of prediction. So is this a reasonable expectation of privacy that one is society is prepared to recognize as reasonable? Again, quoting that 1967 court opinion. Technically speaking, from a pure technical perspective, mosaic theory is correct. You really can start making accurate predictions, and at least under certain circumstances, accuracy goes up sharply after a certain point, and you've got this week by week uh, consistency in, uh, in movement prediction. The Massachusetts Supreme Court has in fact adopted a version of this theory. They haven't, they set the limit at two weeks. They didn't give any basis for the limit. They just said, okay, it's, I think what they said, it's someplace between three week, three days and four weeks. Let's go to round down to two weeks. But they have accepted the premise that a month's worth of tracking is too much. You know, the Jones opinion, uh, I think, I think it was Justice Alito's concurrence said, yeah, you could follow someone around uh, for a month by, by hand. You just have, have a very tiny constable in the, is sitting in the stagecoach in 1788 when the Bill of Rights was adopted. So tiny constable is a little humorous line in the law biz. But fundamentally, we're dealing with a legal question, not a uh, technical one. Is this something that the law will recognize? It's still an undecided question. Uh, it's almost certainly going to be at the Supreme Court in the next very few years. Uh, one colleague of mine, a uh, former prosecutor who is also working, who's working on a paper with me right now, uh, expects it to be at the Supreme Court next year, possibly depending on the uh, outcome of a uh, court case in the 11th Circuit that decision is pending right now. So. If you want more details on it, there's the uh, URL for the paper. I'll actually upload these slides to my uh, website uh, very, you know, very shortly. And uh, you can just click on that link. That's a law review paper, you know, 50, 60 pages, lots of footnotes. Uh, uh, law, law reviews of articles, if written well, can generally be understandable to people who are not uh, lawyers. I hope this one is written that well. I don't know. Three of the four others were not lawyers, so there's some hope. <laughs> so questions? <laughs>